Hello everyone, my name is Rocco Ancora, Canzone Infinity Ambassador, and welcome to the Perfect Printing Process. In this short video, I'm going to share with you my printing workflow and how we go from capture right through to final print. Element number two is the monitor and how we achieve correct calibration. Number three, of course, is the role of the output profile. And all of this in our quest to achieve that perfect print on beautiful Canzone Infinity papers. So let's get started. Okay, so let's begin by answering the most important question. What color space should I work in? Before we can answer this question, let's talk a little bit about color spaces, what they are and what they really mean. So a color space is really nothing more than a mathematical model describing the way colors can be represented. They can describe how many colors and tones can be present in a file. And they also describe how many colors a physical device can reproduce. For example, a monitor. I like to think of them as containers of different size containing color. The bigger the container, the more color it can contain. The three main uh, color spaces that we work with are Profoto RGB, Adobe RGB and sRGB. Now a little bit of a history lesson here as to how these came about beginning with Profoto RGB, which was actually developed by Kodak to encompass the color of their slide film. It offers um, a large gamut with photographic output in mind. Adobe RGB um, was developed by, guess who, Adobe back in 1998. And it was designed to encompass most of the colors achievable on CMYK color printers. And it encompasses roughly around 50% of visible colors. And of course, last but not least, sRGB, developed by Hewlett Packard and Microsoft uh, back in 1996 um, to be used on monitors, printers, and of course, the internet. Now, when we refer to these color spaces, um, we refer to also to the, the color gamut. So the color gamut is really nothing more than the footprint of that particular color space. Now, I have to emphasize here also that gamut, um, as we move from one color space to another, um, is the extent of color or the breadth of color if you if you like that can be reproduced in a color model it is not the number of how much color that image can contain so the question i get asked a lot is do larger color spaces contain more color well the answer to that in a nutshell is really no uh, the color space of a photo says nothing about the total number of colors in an image so pro photo rgb when we look at the diagram, maybe bigger in terms of range, but an image in Profoto RGB color space doesn't have more colors than a photo in sRGB. So an 8-bit image um, contains around 16.8 million RGB values in whatever color space that we choose, whether it's sRGB, Profoto RGB, or Adobe RGB. We have to note also, though, that the color values are spread out further apart the bigger we go in color space. So the Adobe um, RGB, when we move, say, from Adobe RGB to, to Profoto RGB, being a, being a bigger space, those colors in that space are just further apart. What affects the amount of color and the amount of tones present in an image is bit depth. So a bit depth refers to the number of memory bits used to store color data for each pixel. The higher the bit depth of an image, the more colors, of course, it can store. So a one bit image can only store two colors, white, zero, and black, one, as there can only be two values for each pixel. So an eight bit image has 256 different colors. So it can use a total of eight zeros and eight ones. So the way we work this out is two to the power of eight, which equals 256 different combinations. So when we have a look at the table here, a one bit image has two uh, number of, um, of colors that we can actually use or at, at its disposal. Uh, a two bit image um, is of course four, four is 16, eight is 256. And then of course we get to 16 bit, which gives us 65,536 levels of information. And we can see further from uh, uh, the visual diagram here of how that works and how if we, uh, how um, we can see we can see visually that the higher the bit depth, okay, the smoother the gradation of, of tone is 
uh, as we move from um, from shadows through to midtones and then through our highlights. This is extremely important um, when we are working with especially um, a large color space like Profoto RGB where those colors are spaced further apart. Um, we need to work in 16-bit to ensure that we don't we're not uh, getting any artifacts or, or banding um, in, in the color, which is going to really show um, you know, right through to, um, to print. So if you're shooting RAW and processing in Lightroom or Camera Raw and then printing to a wide gamut printer, on beautiful Canzon Infinity papers, there is really only one working space that can contain all the colors that the camera can capture and the printer can print. And that color space is Profoto RGB. But you're probably thinking to yourself, hang on a minute, my camera, my digital camera can be set to either sRGB or Adobe RGB. I don't have a setting for Profoto RGB, so how can this be? The answer to that is quite simple. The question is, what color space should I set my camera to? And really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because raw files don't have profiles attached to them until they are converted into a standard editing space. So the, um, the color space that we choose inside the camera itself only affects the JPEG preview that's embedded inside the raw file that in result gives us the histogram for us to make decisions about our exposure and so on and so forth. So setting Adobe RGB or sRGB has no effect on the raw file captured. We can map that data any which way we like. So the color space, as I said, affects the JPEG preview and the histogram which allows us to make um, really, really good decisions when it comes to exposure. So I prefer to set it to Adobe RGB because the resulting histogram is a far more comprehensive histogram because the Adobe RGB color space is a bigger color space than sRGB. So in order to demonstrate further what colors can be reproduced um, and how the, the selection of the, uh, of the working space will play a huge part into the printed result. I'm here inside of Photoshop and I've created three documents, um, one in Adobe RGB, one in sRGB, and one in Profoto RGB. Three squares, in each of the squares, um, I have 255 um, red, so let's um, bring up our information and our eyedropper here. So let's bring this closer so we can all see it. So as I'm uh, hovering above each one of these, okay, here we go. We got 255 red, 255 uh, green, and 255 uh, blue. The same thing goes for the sRGB um, document. We have uh, 255 uh, red, 255 green, and 255 blue. And of course the Profoto uh, document 255 red, 255 green, and 255 blue. Now I'm displaying these on my ISO monitor. It's a wide gamut monitor, and I actually can see the difference between the three documents. I can see the difference in the reds, I can see the difference in the greens, and I can see the difference in the blues. I'm not sure how this is gonna translate uh, through the internet and through the compression of the video. But what we're gonna do with these um, three documents is we're gonna plot them in a bit of software called ColorThink. And we're going to compare them to um, the color spaces themselves. So let's go into that. Let's go into Color Think. And here we, in this program here, we have the ability to plot those uh, three color values for each of the respective um, documents. Um, so beginning with our sRGB document, let's turn that on. We can see the three dots. We have our 255 red, our 255 blue, our 255 green. In Adobe, we have 255 green up there. The blue is very in a very similar position to the sRGB, and the red is also in a very similar position to the um, to the sRGB. However, um, what we're doing at the moment and why they appear in exactly the same position is because we're looking at the spectrum locus in in uh, two dimension. In other words, from above. If I was to swap that to the three dimensional view. We can actually see that uh, those colors, um, although they may be may appear in the same spot, are actually very different um, luminance values for the reds. The blues are very similar, 
but the reds um, are going to be quite different. I'll explain that a little bit uh, further down the track. So let's go back in 2D. And what I'm going to do now is for those two respective color spaces, we're going to compare them to their respective profiles. So um, let's turn off Adobe. Let's look at sRGB and let's look at the sRGB profile. And you can see that those dots appear on the apex of, um, of these triangles. And all this is really showing us is this is the maximum value of green or the maximum saturation that can be achieved in an sRGB color space. In the, pro, in the Adobe RGB color space, the three dots in the Adobe RGB uh, plot here, the same scenario. And then, of course, the pro photo being the largest color space, those three dots. Um, and we'll have a look at the profile itself and the plot. And you can see that it actually, with pro photo, it goes outside the spectrum locus, um, which means it's actually um, encapsulating more color that we can actually see. So how do these uh, color spaces or working spaces relate to um, what actually can be printed and what the paper and printer combination can actually produce? And to do that, I'm going to show you um, a plot of a um, profile, custom profile for my Epson 9000 printer for the Canzon Brighter Prestige. OK, so I'm just going to turn that on and you can see just how big a gamut this paper can actually um, reproduce. Uh, certainly far bigger than um, Adobe RGB and, um, and sRGB. So really, I would need to be working my file in Profoto RGB to contain all those beautiful colors and then faithfully reproduce them um, with a profile, uh, with a custom profile on, um, on the Canzon Infinity Brighter Prestige. If I'd worked in something like an sRGB, um, I'd be doing myself a huge uh, disservice because I'd be throwing a lot of that uh, precious uh, color way. So for me, I'm just going to turn this RGB and Adobe RGB. I'm always working in Profoto RGB when I'm um, producing beautiful fine art prints for the very simple reason that I want to make sure that I'm using or utilizing, I should say, um, all the beautiful tones and colors that my camera has actually captured. And I want to be able to work with them and I want to be able to then translate them in print. And of course, in the end, what brings uh, the colors um, into the paper's, uh, you know, gamut um, comes down to choosing the right rendering intent um, to make sure that uh, those colors are correctly mapped into the gamut of the paper itself. OK, so let's have a look at how all this information relates to what we see on the screen. OK, so one side of this argument in working with, a, with such a large color gamut is what's the point of working with these colors if we can't actually see them? And that's certainly true if we're working on, um, on say, a cheaper monitor where the colors that you're displaying are going to be quite small. In fact, closer to, say, the, uh, you know, the sRGB sort of um, color space here. Um, so there is a huge disparity between what Profoto is actually doing inside the file and what we can actually see on the screen. However, um, if we were to, say, display the same information on a wide gamut monitor, which I strongly recommend that you invest in if you're serious about producing beautiful fine art prints, then we can make um, far better decisions regarding uh, color and tonality on the screen um, before we actually print it. So you can see here a plot, um, the yellow plot here, which is of my ISO color edge monitor. And you can see just how big that is. It's certainly not nowhere near um, a um, Profoto RGB color space, but it's certainly going to be a lot more comprehensive uh, than, say, looking at a, at a monitor that can only display sRGB or a monitor like an Apple Retina, which is a P3, which is the pink plot here, which is going to be, again, smaller than, um, than what, uh, what a wide gamut monitor is able to, to show you. So at the end of the day, being able to make far more accurate decisions by using um, a wide gamut um, monitor. OK, so part two of our um, color management workflow is, of course, uh, the calibration of the monitor. And it's really probably the most important part because we want to make sure that what we see on the screen is accurate. We want to make sure that uh, the colors that are being displayed are the real colors and not just colors that are imaginary and just being made up by the monitor. So at the end of the day, the monitor is our only window to our image file. And probably the investment of a good monitor is, um, is crucial in order to obtain really, really good prints. 
and not wasting paper going backwards and forwards because what we're getting printed looks nothing like what we see um, on the screen. Okay, so with monitor calibration, now all monitors in the photography and graphic technology industry, which is what we're in, calibrate to an international standard. So that standard is ISO 3664, which we're going to discuss in a minute as to what those parameters are. And of course, with that, there is uh, the calibration standard, but there is also a viewing standard for the appraisal of prints, which is going to be very, very important when we start to make the correlation between print and, um, and uh, the screen itself. So before we begin calibration, we need to set um, a couple of things. We're going to make sure that the environment that we're, our monitor is in and we're doing our editing in is, um, is, uh, is correct. And it's not going to influence our judgment of color and tone on the screen. So the monitor uh, should be the brightest thing in our field of view. Okay, so the ambient room lighting, it is suggested that it should be no greater than 64 lux. Also, besides obviously the intensity of light, uh, the color of the light that's around us is going to be very important because the colors around us will affect our color perception. So if we mainly have uh, tungsten lighting on in the room, our eyes um, would have a specific color bias because um, of our inbuilt uh, auto white balance, if you like. So what we're seeing um, is, um, is actually not going to be correct and we're not going to be able to make those uh, critical color adjustments that we want to make to the file and be accurate at the same time. We really need to make our viewing area as neutral as possible. Now in my editing space, I have set up uh, D50 lighting or 5000 Kelvin lighting. And I've done that using GTI uh, fluorescent tubes up above, but you can do this also using uh, little Solux glo globes. And there's a lot of different ways in which we can achieve that. But 64 lux, as far as the intensity is concerned, um, if you don't have uh, a way of measuring that intensity, you can do it with your camera and it equates to roughly around a 15th of a second at 2.8 at ISO 400. So grab yourself a gray card and put it next to the monitor, uh, making sure that the gray card is only being illuminated by the ambient light and uh, set it, set your camera to spot meter and make sure that those parameters are 15th of a second, 2.8 at ISO 400 is what it's reading. So the monitor, the brightest thing in our field of view, and the room is as neutral as we could possibly make it. So painting your walls white and not having any, any colors uh, coming into the room. That also applies to having windows that are, that, are, that are open, allowing daylight to come through. And as you know, daylight, the color temperature of it will change throughout the day. Um, you know, perfect daylight would be sort of around midday-ish, but that's also dependent whether you've got direct sunlight coming through or whether it's, uh, you know, the light being reflected off a blue sky or it's an overcast day. So there's a lot of parameters. So ideally, we want to control the light um, artificially 100%. So ISO 3664 for um, all uh, editing um, is uh, basically this. So it tells us that the screen should be set to a maximum luminance of 120 candela and um, our white point should be D65 or 6,500 Kelvin and our gamma 2.2 or native. Now these parameters are parameters that you put into your calibration software and um, whether you're using an external calibrator like an x i1 or whether you do have an ISO and you have an internal calibrator built into the monitor, which is why I love these monitors so much that uh, once you put all the parameters in the monitor itself, um, it just um, has its own calibration device and it achieves the, um, the uh, color based upon the parameters that we have put in um, automatically um, without you even thinking about it. So I have mine programmed so that um, every Monday morning it turns itself on and um, it does its calibration. So I know I'm always working on a calibrated uh, monitor. So ISO 3664 3 is for general photography and editing. Uh, and that's how we make all our assessment as far as uh, color and tone. Now, the other side of the co coin, of course, is once we do calibrate the monitor and we have, have done our editing, is matching the print to screen, which is probably the part that most photographers have heartache with. Uh, this is where we can sort of eliminate really the need to do multiple test prints. And at the end of the day, we don't want to waste paper. Okay, so there is a way of matching print uh, to screen. 
Usually the most common problem is the prints when we print them are too dark. Okay, they might look the same sort of color, but the prints are going to be too dark. Now, this is because the monitor usually is set to an appropriate state for print work. In other words, the monitor is showing us the right colors, but an overly bright version of the colors. Now, if this is the case and you are, your prints are, are coming back uh, too dark, it basically means that your prints, um, that you're, sorry, that your monitor is, uh, is too bright. So for, um, for output, I run a second profile on the monitor. So I go from the ISO 3664 at 120 candela to ISO 3664 to 90 candela. So 90 candela seems to work well for my environment and my lighting conditions. So um, with the ISO monitors, I can just switch from one profile to the other and um, I can do my output and my output will match the screen uh, perfectly. Okay, so as I said earlier, also for the practical appraisal of prints, ISO 3664 also stipulates a certain light intensity for us to make uh, the correct judgment um, on color and tone of a print. The luminance is always going to be D50 and the light intensity this time is 500 lux to actually view the prints. I know some people say, well, I'll just take my prints outside. But once again, sure, you can go outside, but what color temperature is illuminating your prints? We know that daylight is going to vary in temperature throughout the course of the day, the morning to the midday to afternoon. It's going to produce very different colors. So we might get the density probably right, but the color is really not going to, not going to be that accurate because um, the color that it's actually falling um, on the print as we make our appraisal um, has, um, has, a, has a color cast to it. So in my workflow, I use a GTI viewing booth um, where I can adjust the intensity of the light. Um, the booth is going to give me D50 lighting and uh, I can make uh, the direct uh, correlation between what I see and the screen um, in the proper environment. The last piece of the jigsaw puzzle is, of course, the output profile or the paper profile. So the role of the printer profile is twofold. One is to reduce the number of test prints um, that we do. And really, at the end of the day, we want to eliminate those altogether and not waste paper. But also the paper profile translate color and the, and the tones in the image to the print itself. So when we look at the mechanics of printing, so when we look at an image on the screen, we know that every pixel has an individual color with a specific color value. Now, when we print, we send that pixel of color with its specific color recipe to the printer and the printer driver will interpret that recipe into dots of ink. And those dots of ink or that recipe represents a specific color value. So the printer paper profile um, is like a translator of translating information from one device to the other device. So it translates color numbers from our monitor to our color values on the printed page. Now, there's a couple of different ways of obtaining paper profiles. And if you're just getting starting into, into fine art printing, you can download appropriate paper profiles specific to your printer model from the paper manufacturers. So you can jump onto the Cans on Infinity website and download one. I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. Or you can create one yourself. Or you can get one made from a printing bureau. And there are benefits in doing custom profiles, which I will show you um, in just a few moments. So to download the paper profiles from uh, the Cans on Infinity website, we first have to specify um, the printer model and um, what we're actually printing on because that will upload um, will show us all the different range of papers and the different profiles that are associated with that specific um, um, printer. So you'll note that in the download section you'll have your papers on the left hand side and then you have your media settings. Now the media settings are extremely important because those media settings will then translate into what you set into your um, um, printer driver itself and that media setting really governs the amount of ink that is going to be put down onto the page. They, they uh, control the ink loads um, so it is imperative that you pay attention to what those media settings are and you set those correctly into your printer driver 
otherwise you're going to get all sorts of um, of different um, of different results so media settings and of course the ink that is being used whether it's a matte black ink matte black ink for uh, for the rag style papers or whether we use photo blacks for the burritos and um, and the coated papers the other thing we can do obviously um, if you're getting more into advanced printing is to write a custom uh, profile yourself or you can get one made for you now there is a huge advantage in getting um, a custom profile made because the custom profile really fingerprints the characteristics of your printer with your paper um, taking into consideration the inks that you're using the ink load and of course the dpi itself it does yield to superior results so what I'm going to do now, just to show you the difference between a, um, a canned profile from um, the website, which, by the way, they are very, very good profiles, but um, they are quite different to what you can actually get made yourself for your specific printer. So let's jump into ColorThink, now ColorThink software, and let's uh, have a look at a few different plots of, um, of different profiles. So we'll begin with the Canzon Infinity profile for RAG Photographique. And, um, and there it is. So this is the CAN profile. And I'm going to show you how this now compares to a custom profile that I have for the same printer. But it was custom made for my printer. So this is the RAG Photographique um, custom plot, uh, custom profile plot for um, for the same paper. Have a look at the difference. So you can see obviously the gamut volume is far greater than the CAN profile. So as I said, the custom profiles do yield a far better result. And you can see this in the type of color, the, the colors that it reproduces, but also in the tonality in the image. And we can see it through shadow detail, highlight detail, and throughout the, um, the tonal range. So let's have a look at another one. We'll have a look at uh, a custom profile for the um, the Barada Prestige, and we're going to compare that uh, to the Prestige um, Cans on Infinity profile, and you can see it that it's going to be much smaller. Not as much difference as we saw in the Rag Photographic, but still different. So the um, custom ICC profile is going to give you a superior result. However, having said that, the profiles that are available on the Cans on Infinity uh, website, if you are starting out, will yield. Um, pretty good results okay so let's have a look at the practical aspect of how we set up our color management policies in Lightroom and Photoshop to make sure that uh, we maintain and preserve um, the uh, the correct um, working space uh, throughout our workflow so automatically um, as we discussed earlier when uh, images are brought into Lightroom raw files are brought into Lightroom right Lightroom maps those colors out into a big color space um, Profoto RGB. It's not actually Profoto RGB, but it's very, very similar to the Profoto RGB color space. Now, what happens from this point as we make our adjustments is, of course, we dictate um, once we move out of the Lightroom environment, out of the raw environment, into our editing environment through Photoshop in the form of a TIFF or a PSD, is the ability to maintain that profile. And we can, of course, change it to whatever profile we want but if we are working in um, Profoto RGB we want to make sure that we maintain that across our, um, our workflow so there's a couple of things here in Lightroom if we go into our Lightroom preferences and we set up our external editing this is where we set up um, how uh, the color management policy is going to work once we move out, out of this environment so I've got it set up so that when I right click on an image and I say edit in um, in Photoshop, it'll go into Photoshop as a PSD, it'll go into Photoshop in the Pro Photo RGB color space, and it'll go there as a 16 bit file, and it will go in there. I usually have this set to 360 DPI because, uh, um, or I should say 360 PPI, because that is what I'm, what I'm using because I'm printing on Epson, and there's an entire video that I've done for Cans on Infinity on preparing files for print as to PPI versus DPI so you can uh, check that out a little bit later so 360 so this is what I um, I set up so in other words if I right click on any of these images and I go edit in Adobe Photoshop so let's have a look go into edit in uh, Adobe Photoshop it will open up as a PSD 
um, in um, in that color space that I have dictated. And of course, in our export um, in our export uh, uh, button down below here, um, and um, if I go into into the export in the in our file settings, I can choose PSD, I can choose TIFF, and I can choose the designated color space of what I want to go to so working in Profoto RGB so that's how we set it up in um, in Lightroom now inside of uh, Photoshop so let's have a look at our color management policies in here as well because you want to make sure the two are speaking the same language and Photoshop isn't converting to another color space as it's opening the image as it's bringing it in so we go into our um, our preferences um, over here in our color settings sorry in our color settings this is where we set up our pro photo rgb color space which is our rgb working space then down below here where we have our color management policies this is the most crucial section because unless we have these boxes ticked um, if we have another color space up there photoshop might convert to whatever color space you have set in here. So if you have a disparity between one color space and the other, Photoshop will govern over that and saying, well, I'm just gonna open it and make whatever I want with it. So if there is a profile mismatch, we wanna make sure that that box is ticked, ask when opening. So if we are opening um, a Profoto RGB file in here, and um, that's not gonna be a problem, but assuming now uh, Photoshop is set to another working space, and we are bringing in a, a say, a, a a pro photo RGB um, file in there we want to make sure that Photoshop is then going to convert it to say sRGB or Adobe RGB so we want to be able to do it when it's opening an image also when pasting from one document to another so if you have two images and we might be doing a composite if we're pasting one from the other and they do have two different profiles um, we want to make sure that um, you know you get to, to choose what you're going to do with those colors and of course if there is a missing profile it's going to ask you when when you open that file as well so this is this is the important section and this is where it you know we get control as to what we do with the color itself the conversion options up here we leave those in the adobe ace engine and of course our intent we just leave as uh, relative color metric black point compensation um, and um, all those boxes are checked um, as is. So very important that um, Photoshop and Lightroom are speaking the same language, especially when you're, you're doing the right click option and bringing images in and working them. And then you might want to bring maybe a layered PSD back into, into Lightroom. Um, you want to make sure that that color space is being preserved and we're not getting conversions that shouldn't really be happening. Okay, so let's have a look at the color management policy is also for um, for camera raw so this image here is just opening camera raw and down below here if we click onto onto that um, that dialog um, we bring up our workflow options and here we choose our color space um, whatever color space we want to open this image as so we're working pro photo of course um, the resolution and of course the bit depth is specified here so we're working in uh, in 16 bits as well also, just a quick note to what's happening here with the histogram. The histogram will change based upon the information um, and how we're changing that information and putting it into a specific uh, you know, color space. So from sRGB, um, we can see that the information here on the upper end of uh, where the highlights are, some of the information has gone almost um, off the charts and we're clipping some information. And of course, Profoto RGB being the larger color space contains that quite beautifully. Another one of the reasons why we choose Profoto RGB as our color space. So anyway, this is how we set it up here in Adobe Camera Raw. This little test that I do before I print. Now, uh, this is once the file is uh, is sized and uh, it's ready to go. Now I have a, an entire video here on the Cans on uh, Infinity um, page on uh, preparing or optimizing your files for print. So assuming we've done all that and we're ready to go, the last thing we do is we want to determine the paper's black point and white point. What that basically means is that I want to know how dark, what's the darker shadow that I can actually print with detail on my paper. 
And the way I do that is I print uh, this little test, which is actually available as a free download on my website. It's just a document that I prepared. You can prepare one of these yourselves. It's just very tedious and it takes a very long time. But the numbers that you see there on the screen are basically just your RGB values from a value of zero right through to, um, I've gone going in the blacks up to 48 and in the whites they range from 243 to 255. So once I print it, what I want to see when I'm examining um, when I'm examining in the document is where I'm starting to see differentiation between uh, zero black, the pure black, in other words, the base of that document, um, and um, the the dots. Okay, so we're going to print this um, black and white test ramp. Um, we're going to choose obviously the appropriate paper profile that we're going to print with. And we're going to let the print dry and we examine what black and white values are visible. Now, this is basically doing a black point compensation or a black point adjustment manually, which is my preferred way of, uh, of doing things because I don't want that entire tonal scale of my image shifted, okay, which is what tends to happen with black point compensation. So this is doing a black point compensation, but doing it manually and having a little bit more control. I'm gonna show you how we actually now tweak the document inside of Photoshop. So once uh, once the image um, is um, is printed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to examine it. And I'm going to see where the detail starts to come in, and you can see from the image here on the screen um, on this particular paper, it starts to come in probably at around uh, six based on the profile that I'm using. What that what that means is that any values in my file that are below that are going to print with absolutely zero detail. Okay, so the idea is now that we're going to go into Photoshop, adjust the, uh, examine our document first and foremost, and then adjust it accordingly if we need to make that adjustment based upon what the paper can actually achieve as far as um, printable shadow detail. So let's jump into Photoshop. Okay, so we're here inside of Photoshop, and um, let's just... Um, talk a little bit more about um, the this black test and what I'm actually looking for. So if we have our histogram um, and going from zero to say 255, so we have our shadows on the left hand side, our highlights on the right hand side and our midtones somewhere in the middle. And uh, we have our histogram. And once we examine our histogram for our image, we have a histogram probably that'll look something along those lines. What this is telling us is that in our file, our tones range from zero right through to 255. However, when we examine our test print and we can start to only see differentiation of detail at a value of six or say eight, right, onwards, it means that all the details between zero and eight that are in our files are gonna print as a solid black, okay? And that's not what we want. Because ideally what we want to do is shift our histogram so that we have 0, 255. Okay, our information starts at around 8 and goes still right through to 255. Okay, so we want to be able to shift that tonal range in the in the shadows right through up to the... Um, up to that level where we can see that that detail. Like I said, for this particular paper is around six to eight. That's where we start to see a difference. For some papers, it could be as high as ten, depending on the profile and depending on the on the paper combination and so on. So um, there is no exact number there. It's going to really be based on um, on your own personal tests of uh, of what you do. So let's have a look at our print that we're ready to print. So this is the print I am printing or the file that I'm printing. So I'm going to just bring our layers palette across here so we can see what we're doing a little bit better. There it is. And so we have our image. And what I'm going to do is create an adjustment layer of levels above that. And let's have a look at our histogram. What's happening with our histogram here? Okay, so we can see a little bit of a gap, which means we haven't totally destroyed our, our dark tones in here. That means there is detail there, but we need to be able to print it. So let's examine first as to when the detail in our shadows uh, starts to come in. So I'm going to press the Alt key on the keyboard and click onto the shadow slider. There it is. And as I move it to the right, I'm looking at the values and I can see that I've got detail sort of, I've got a little bit of detail coming in at two, but the bulk of my detail 
starts at around four and then it moves um, moves forward. So if I was to say, go to the level of, uh, just say I'm assuming my paper now says eight is the lowest value that it can actually decipher shadow information. All that information that you see here on the screen um, is basically going to be lost or it's going to be muddy or it's just not going to look right. So we don't want to do that. So we're going to need to be able to adjust adjust this um, um, this file so that that shadow information um, is um, is printable. So um, the simplest way we can do that is down here in our output level is purely change that number from zero, which is what it is now, to the value that is uh, that is showing on our paper, which just assuming say it was eight. So I'm going to put eight and uh, as you can see, um, you know, it's changed, but it's changed the whole image. So in other words, this is what black point compensation is actually doing automatically if we were to choose it in the in the um, in the driver, in the print driver, is that that entire tonal scale is moved. We don't really want that. OK, so if I just do another um, another level adjustment layer up on top, I'm going to call this check so we can check to see what we're doing. OK, and um, let's have a look at the histogram now. Of the of our check layer, and this is our adjustment layer. So I'm going to call that adjustment. Okay, and if I turn that on and off, let's pay attention to the histogram. Turning it on and off. Okay, let me go to the top histogram. You see that the entire tonal scale is shifting, particularly up here in the mid tones and the three quarter tones up the top. So let's have a look at that again. It's shifting, and. I don't really want that. Okay, I just want the shadows um, to, um, you know, to be effective of that particular tonal range. Now we could sit here and use the things like blend if modes. We could use uh, luminosity masks, um, which um, are extremely accurate um, but quite complex. But the simplest, really, the simplest way to do it is instead of using levels to adjust this, um, is is curves. With curves, we can do exactly the same things as level, but we can control and pin the points of the curve in the corresponding tonal range. In other words, they're not going to move. We're just going to move the points that are essential in making this adjustment work. So I'm going to switch off our original adjustment layer and we're going to work in curves. And over here in the curves palette, okay, we have input and output. So we have those numbers happening exactly the same as our, as our levels dialog, uh, except now they're being represented in, a, in curve format. So our point here, which is our zero point, um, once I clicked onto it, I can use my arrows to nudge that up. So you can see the output value now is shifting. Okay, and I'm going to shift it to say eight because that was the, the point that we had determined on the paper as to where we can um, start to see detail. And if I was to leave it as is, and if I turn that on and off, okay, and we go back to our check histogram, we've achieved exactly the same result as we did with levels. In other words, everything's moving. So let's be a little bit more accurate. Let's go back to our curve. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to begin with the midpoint. So at 128, um, so I'm just going to use my arrows to nudge that down as far as 128. And I'm going to make sure my output is 128 also. So I'm going to lock my midtones and I'm going to lock my point up here as well. So input is 206 and my output is 206 also so that's locked and i'm going to come down and start to lock probably a point somewhere along here because i want just want those extreme shadows down below to start shifting so 62 62 okay so now if i turn it on and off okay i'm applying that adjustment just to the toe of the curve just here so if we go back to our check histogram up the very very top and switch on and off our curves layer. Okay, so let's turn it on and off. Um, you can see that up here in our midtones and onwards, there is zero movement. Okay, but what I have done is opened up those shadows so that they are printable and they're going to be full of details and they're going to look amazing in the final print. So once I've uh, once I've done that, is uh, I just flatten the image. Uh, and of course, assuming the image is sized and sharpened and all the things that I discussed in the optimizing files for print video, um, I'm ready to go and print. So I'll go into file, uh, print. So we're printing on Epson. So just showing you just the print dialog and what to have turned on and what to have turned off. 
So we've got to make sure that over here we're in um, Photoshop Manager's Colors and we are choosing the right um, profile for the paper that we are printing on. And because we've done our manual adjustment on our black point um, with our rendering intent, we turn that off. Okay, so we turn that off. We go then into our print settings. One of the other um, crucial things that we need to do, and this information is going to be available on the uh, on the Cans on Infinity website when you download your profile, um, is to make sure that the media type that you have set is what is specified for that specific um, um, you know profile, because otherwise um, the printer is going to give us a different ink load um, and it's going to yield a very very different result. So the profiles have been written with a certain media type. Uh, as I said earlier, to, to make them work the way they do. So we've got to make sure that um, we, we follow suit. Okay, so, and then of course your print quality, uh, we adjust that accordingly and um, we go ahead and print. So doing the black point, and we can do the same thing for the white point for that matter, but usually you'll find, especially on the art papers, that the issues always lie with the shadows and getting those shadows to print and not getting those shadows to look really nasty and, um, and blocked up. Um, doing this test um, is going to save you a lot of heartache and it's going to yield a really, really beautiful result. So in summary, here are all the main points to consider in our color management workflow when creating fine art prints um, using a wide gamut printer. And um, beginning with, of course, the color space, um, the editing stage, and what we set our cameras to, the profiling, um, making sure that we know what our profile is doing um, to our paper, what we can print and what we can't print, adjusting our file accordingly, and then creating a nice, beautiful, fine art print. So I sincerely hope you all enjoyed this video tutorial, and I really look forward to seeing you all next time.